Well, I don't think I'm going to be giving away any great secrets if I tell you that the answer to the question, does Leninism matter today, is yes. I haven't suddenly had a, you know, Damascene conversion to anarchism or something like that. Um, but given, given that the answer is yes, why have this meeting? And I think the answer is partly that um, a, a couple of organizations which in different ways represent the Len or a part of the Leninist tr tradition uh, have experienced very severe crises recently the, uh, in the United States, the biggest far left group, the International Socialist Organization imploded and ended up dissolving itself. But also an important international current of the, the far left, the uh, Committee for a Workers International, whose uh, local affiliate is the Socialist Party, has, has split in a, in a really quite severe way. And commentators on the left have said that these, these crises are further evidence of the uh, irrelevance of Leninism today. But I think, in fact, if you look, look around the kind of discussions and even more deep, deeply uh, assumptions that we find on the left inter internationally, the idea that Leninism is irrelevant is almost a dogma and has been so for quite a considerable period of time. If we look at some of the most important movements that have renewed the left internationally, uh, in, re in recent years, like over the last, let's say, two decades, like the anti-capitalist movement that emerged from the Seattle protests in 1999, or the Occupy movement that exploded um, internationally in 2011 in response to the Ara Arab revolutions, the, the kind of organizational ideology of these movements well, is what has come to be known as horizontalism. In other words, the idea that what we try to create is movements where communication is at the same level between different networks of activists and so on, that uh, no network has the right or ability to, uh, if you like, impose its will or, on, on others, we interact with each other, we have the different networks of uh, autonomy, and somehow we will converge together in a movement that will, in the end, transform the world. I mean, to some extent, this has been articulated in the most sophisticated way by uh, Michael Hart and Tony Negri in their book Empire and the, the sequels, Multitude, and so, so on and so, so forth. And um, in how these movements organized themselves, this has been expressed in different ways, like the social forums that were very important in the anti-capitalist movement um, explicitly banned the participation of political, political parties because they're kind of vertical organizations that impose their will. Now, if you examine the practice of these and other movements, um, you, you see that, in fact... There were all sorts of um, vertical elements to this, these movements, uh, formal or informal ways in which groups emerged to make decisions and shape uh, the kind of processes that were, that were going on. Uh, and it's quite interesting that the most exciting movement at the present time, namely Extinction Rebellion, is, uh, you know, is a mass, has developed into a mass movement but there's an initiating centre that, uh, you know, called the protests and organised the protests and lays down an agenda. It's, it's interesting. I mean, we still need fully to understand uh, what's going on and it, what's going on is partly dependent upon what everyone who's involved in the climate protests do um, in, the, in the future, say, around the Earth Strike um, on the 20th of September and so on. But it's interesting that there is this kind of organizing center, wouldn't call itself a party or anything like that, but there is an organizing center. In any case, there's, um, it remains the case that there's enormous suspicion of party type 
organisations on very wide sections of the left, and arguments that the very form of the party is, is obsolete. And when people try to justify this, partly they point to the historic failure of the main parties of the left, if you like, the two families of left parties. On the one hand, on the, one hand the communist parties, which once upon a time were very, very important, particularly in the most militant and organised groups of workers uh, throughout much of, much of Europe, but also the social democratic parties, the Labour Party and its, um, and its, uh, its counterparts in, in, other, in other countries. It's, it's very widely perceived that both these traditions have failed, and since these traditions are very much traditions of, of parties, whether organised in a centralised and undemocratic Stalinist way, in the way the Communist Party is all organised, or whether organised essentially around electoralism, around winning elections, that the, the way the Social Democrats, democratic, dem, Democrats have. Both these traditions are seen as, seen as failing, but, and producing in, in all sorts of ways very bad results, disasters of different kinds. Most importantly, the disasters associated with the Stalinist regimes in the Soviet Union and so on. But I think we also need to take into account the crisis of the mainstream party systems. You know, if we look throughout, I mean, you know, you just have to look at the opinion polls to see that the existing mainstream party system is in a state of semi-meltdown in this country. But this isn't a, a unique British disease. If you look across Europe you see something quite, um, quite uh, similar. And in this context, where both the historic parties of the left and the mainstream party systems you know, have visibly failed and are in crisis, or in the case of some parties have just, just disappeared, um, this helps to, uh, to legitimise the idea that, that Leninism has failed, inasmuch as Leninism, and I'm going to say much more about what Leninism means, is a project of building a revolutionary party. Given these large-scale failures, then, um, then the, 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 the particular pre Leninist project of building a revolu revolutionary party uh, must, must be irrelevant. Now, elsewhere at Marxism, John Molyneux has... Um, spoken in defense of party building and he's written a very good article for international socialism on the subject and I very much agree with his the arguments he's going to put, put that he's putting forward but I think it's worth saying that if we're talking about Leninism then Leninism is about more than simply party building if we mean by Leninism something like Lenin's the leader of the Bolshevik parties, the leader of the Russian revolutions, distinctive con contribution to Marxism, what he really contributed as opposed to what the Stalinist falsifiers claimed about him, then I, I would start to explain his ideas, to explain his contribution somewhere else. I think in, in lots of ways the thing that runs through all Lenin's uh, both writings, very diverse writings on all sorts of different, different questions, the agrarian question, you know, all sorts of things. Um, and in his practice is what I would call the primacy of politics. And if you want to understand what, what I mean by that, um, I'll quote some, one of Lenin's most famous sayings, which is that politics is the most concentrated expression of economics. Um, now, that's an interesting statement. Politics is the most concentrated expression of economics. It shows that Lenin, in giving primacy to politics, wasn't kind of abandoning Marx's theory of history and, in particular, the idea that the economic base, the social production, the forces, relations of production are, as Marx put it, the real foundation on the basis of which things like politics and culture and ideology and law arise and on which they, they, they depend. Lenin wasn't abandoning that, but he was reaffirming, reaffirming something that Marx himself says, 
that all the contradictions of class society are concentrated and condensed in the shape of the state. And it's the state that um, is at the core of what we understand by, by, by politics. Now, lots of people, you know, particularly academics and commentators, those, those sorts of people, ideologists of different kinds, if you, if you like, what Marx called the literary and ideological representatives of the bourgeoisie, if we want to be more precise. Um, lots of people confronted with those sorts of statements would say, but politics doesn't play this kind of role anymore. Um, look, we can see how globalization means the decline of the nation state. Uh, the mainstream parties, as we've already discussed, are in, are in crisis, and therefore politics doesn't play this kind of condensing and concentrating role that Marx and Lenin thought that he did. But I think these kinds of statements are palpably false. I mean, look at Brexit. I mean, Brexit, you know, means a profound crisis for British society and for the, the political economy of Britain. What on earth is going to happen to British capitalism um, with uh, Britain's um, kind of attempts to move out of the European Union? But the reason why there's this tremendous crisis is because the political system is paralyzed and deadlocked. It's a crisis of the state, of the, the political system. Um, Trump, as um, the Trump presidency, among other things, you know, it's, a, it's sort of bizarre in all sorts of, sorts of ways, of course, you know, surreal. Trump's announcement that the American Revolution involved seizing the airports, you know. <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you? Um, but it's, you know, what is, what is the domain of struggle? The domain of struggle is at the level of politics. Trump, you know, using his power as president, control over the federal government to attack migrants, to launch a trade war with China, his opponents using in the Democrats and so on, doing different aspects of the, the state apparatus, including, I think, Trump is right to say, the FBI, the CIA, to take, take him on. Again, this is a crisis that is manifested at the level of the, the state. And the party, existing party system is in crisis, but it doesn't mean parties disappear. We get new parties. You know, part of the problem in British politics at, at the present time is the success, at least in the short term, of the Brexit party. And it's just one attempt, among others, by the far right to create parties that can reshape the political system on a much more reactionary basis throughout the advanced, advanced cap capitalist world. So it's, it's non the, the idea that Lenin's notion of politics as the most concentrated expression of economics is outdated and so on is, is, is nonsense. Now, uh, another great Marxist, Antonio Gramsci, said that what he called hegemony, he, one of his key concepts, exists when a class suc successfully asserts its claim to dominate society. Uh, hegemony is when a class is able to establish for very broad sections of society that, the, if you like, it's right to do dominate uh, so society. Uh, and Gramsci correctly argued that, um, that this is a thoroughly Len Leninist idea this is re reflected in the fact that um, Gramsci argues, for example, that parties are key organizers of hegemony. Hegemony is something, isn't something that floats in the air. Political organizations and the people who develop its ideologies, those, their ideologies and seek to st spread them in the population and, and so on and so forth, they are necessary to establish a particular form of hegemony so that the, the project of revolutionary Marxism that's articulated, for example, by Lenin in his, one of his most famous books, What is to be Done, is about making the working class the hegemonic class in this sense. The problem is that capitalist society works systematically to prevent the working class 
from getting anywhere near being a he hegemonic class. Normally, the working class, to use another term of Gramsci's, is thor thoroughly subaltern, thoroughly subordinated politically, above all, to the, to the ca capitalist class. There are all sorts of mechanisms that work to, um, to, to keep the working class subordinate and dominated by other classes above all the capitalists. There's the kind of fragmentation of consciousness that Marx argues is built into the very functioning of, ca of capitalism, the way in which the market um, works to prevent people from properly understanding their place within so society. Um, there's the separation of economics and politics, which is a recurrent feature, particularly of the advanced capitalist societies. And this separation of politics and economics is crucial to making reformism viable. Because reformism is essentially having a kind of division of labor in which the trade unions try and win bread and butter reforms at the economic level that don't challenge the system and the, uh, the Social Democratic Party also achieve, seeks to achieve limited reforms by winning elections. But the idea that the working... And the more the separation of economics and politics works, the less the working class is a political subject. The less the working class is a, is a, is a class asserting itself and asserting its, uh, its right to rule. And finally, you have the mechanisms of divide and rule to set different groups of workers against each other, of which the most uh, uh, obvious example is, 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 um, ra is racism. So the most fundamental reason for building a revolutionary party in the Leninist tradition is to swim against the stream of how capitalism works, to swim against the stream of the normal workings of capitalism, and to strive in every way possible to help the working class become um, a, a, a political subject, a class asserting its claim to hegemony. Now, this helps to clarify one of the classic criticisms of Leninism, which is that Leninists are power-crazy uh, people who want to create a party that will seize power in the name of the working class. Absolutely not. Absol absolutely not. Serious, a serious Leninist organization is not about substituting itself for real working class mo movements, but living, uh, but rather promoting a living interaction between the Revolutionary Party and the rest of the working class. A an interaction that encourages workers to organize more effectively. This, this is something that Marx already states in the Communist Manifesto, that the, that the, uh, the communists are the most conscious uh, and well-organized section of the working class, uh, and in particular the section of the working class that identifies the, the general interests of the class and the direction of movement of its struggle, and that fights, therefore participating in workers' struggles, to direct those struggles in the direction that will advance the uh, party's cause. Now, I have to make an important qualification here. I'm stating an ideal. This is how revolutionary organization should work. Anyone who's got any actual experience of building revolutionary organization knows that revolutionary organizations, just like any kind of, kind of organization, can develop various irrationalities and even dysfunction, dis, I can't even pronounce the, the word, dysfunctionalities of their own. In other words, to put it crudely, we don't always live up to our, our, our ideals. And that reflects, in particular, the kind of material pressures, and not simply material pre pressures, the subjective, the mental, the ideological pressures that come from building an organization that necessarily exists within cap capitalist society. I mean, look at this place, you know, we, we rent these, these buildings for, for Marxism, you know, we have to raise the money, we have to conform to various rules and regulations and things, things like that. 
you know, we're trying, we're trying to work to overthrow capitalism, but we're, we're in all sorts of ways constrained by capitalism, and this generates frustrations and, and difficulties. And sometimes uh, people get tired and they get demoralized, and they just think the whole project is too, too difficult. But none of these kinds of difficulties, all the, the bigger things that can go wrong, the real defeats, like the defeat of the miners' strike in, in this country in the mid-1980s, none of all this is any reason to uh, uh, give up on the project of uh, building a revolutionary party because revolutionary organization is necessary um, uh, in order for the working class to become the kind of political subject that can overthrow capitalism. Now, it's interesting that the necessity of political organization, I talked about the predominance of horizontalism, and I also talked about the way in which in practice, in the, the movements that have developed over the last 20 years, horizontalism is qualified by all sorts of often shadow leaderships that um, effectively direct the, those movements. Incidentally, this is one of the things that is good about revolutionary organization. Uh, what we do is what we say on the tin. You know, we are organized revolutionary socialists who want to help to lead a working class struggle to overthrow capitalism. In other words, we, we don't pretend you know, we don't keep two books of accounts. We don't say, everyone, you know, let's just, you know, have our own different networks and see how it goes and all that kind of thing. No, we say, we think a movement, the mo movement of workers and struggles, workers' struggles and struggles of the oppressed have to go in a certain direction in all, order to win, and we will fight for that direction in an, in an open way with our publications, our meetings, uh, our agitation, our conversations with indivi individuals. So, there, so we are open about not just our objectives, but about what we do in a way that isn't true of much of the practice in, in contemporary movements. But even so, even more, in the past few years, we've seen, um, we've seen movements of the left which either give rise to or are dependent on um, in um, the, the development of party organizations. This is partly expressed in the new left parties we've seen in, in southern Europe like Podemos and Syriza. It's also reflected in the transformation of the part, a very partial transformation of the Labour Party, but nevertheless a transformation expressed in the huge uh, uh, surge of people to join the Labour Party under under Jer Jeremy Corbyn. But the tragedy of Syriza reflects, in, underlines the importance of program and strategy. In other words, yeah, there are different ways in practice that people acknowledge the necessity of party organization, but that what, what is needed is the right kind of party um, in the sense of a party with a realistic program of transformation and a coherent strategy for achieving that transformation, uh, none of which is what Syriza had. So, but let me, let me, so I think it's become clear that I think that when we talk about building a revolutionary organization, we're talking about a very tough and demanding project that has its moments of frustration and, and disappointment. And I think to, one, way, one way to get beyond that frustration and disappointment is to adopt a historical perspective. Because the, the workers' movement in the 20th century is fundamentally shaped by the triumph of Stalinism in the Soviet Union. Not simply because that means the the defeat in an unexpected form of the first real workers' social, socialist revolution, but also because for really two generations, much of the 20th century, 
the best, most dedicated, most organized working class militants uh, found themselves um, largely under the hegemony or within the, within, the, within the communist parties. And they're also, as I've already mentioned, the social democratic parties. This meant that the general, genuine revolutionary left was profoundly isolated. I remember um, talking to Tony Cliff, the founder of the SWP, um, at the end of uh, 1989, which was an extraordinary year of upheaval with the fall of the Stalinist regimes in Eastern Europe. And I said to him, thank God the 1980s are over. They were a horrible decade with the defeat of the miners and things like that. And he just looked at me and you know, fairly contemptuously and say, you think the 1980s were bad? You should have been around in the 1950s. You know, in other words, the height of the Cold War, when Stalinism and social democracy completely dominated the left and Cliff was part of a tiny handful of, of revolutionaries. So we have this long historical period in which revolutionaries are marginalized. Now they begin to break out of that marginalization as a result of the great upheavals of the 1960s and early 1970s. May 68, the student rebellions, black power in the United States, the whole wave of social rebellion that throws the traditional reformist parties into crisis, but also creates an opening for the revolutionary left. And it's really that is the moment of breakthrough for organizations like the SWP, but many far left organizations in other parts of the world as well. And it was a tremendously exciting time. But we were too, our starting point was one of too great weakness to be able during that period of upturn to develop a real challenge to the dominant reformist organizations, including by this stage the, the communist party. So we had a great meeting um, about the Portuguese Revolution with Raquel Varela and Peter Robinson earlier today. This is many, in many ways the high, turn of, high point of the upturn of the mid-1970s. Mid, uh, it's a fantastic story of you know, revolutionary potential shown by workers, by soldiers, and so, so on and so forth, but the revolution failed, and it failed because the genuinely revolutionary left was too weak to break the, the power of the Communist Party. Now we see this same pattern again in the period after Seattle, the period of the 2000s, when you have these huge movements against neoliberalism and against, against the, the war in Iraq and so on and so forth, and you get the revival of the left after a long period of defeat and the emergence of different kinds of radical left, left parties. You you have then, again as was true in the 1960s and 1970s, a kind of race between the revolutionary left and the more reformist left about who is going to dominate that revival of the left. And the honest truth is the, the reformist left won. People like Mélenchon uh, in France or um, Tsipras in Greece. You know, serious far left organizations in, the, in, in those countries and in other countries, like, including Britain, but not, not strong enough, not, sometimes not coherent enough ideologically or organizationally to uh, really shape the direction of this revival of the left. And that's the, that, and oh, sometimes that produced serious crises in the, uh, the far left organizations like the new anti-capitalist party in France, or indeed our own, the SWP here, here in Britain. This is the context in which we have the, the reformists, rep, the left reformists, people like Tsipras, dominating the left response to the crisis and austerity. So twice at moments of the development of the left, the, um, the reformists from their Strong, much strong, more strongly established position have won the race with the, the far left. But the fact that the reformists win and then fail 
leads to a weak, further weakening of the reformist organisations themselves. I mean, this is clearest about, among some of the more mainstream social democratic parties. Look at the Socialist Party in France, which has been completely marginalised in the past, past few years. Or the Social Democratic Party in Germany, the historic party of the Second International, the great citadel of reformism, uh, in really in the world for a very long time, which, you know, is doing its best to marginalise itself through its, its coalition. Yep, yep, yep. Um, coalition with, with Merkel and the, the Conservatives. So the reformists win, but they undermine themselves through the way in which they essentially throw away their victory by being incapable of developing a successful challenge to the, to the system. Well, now we're in a new conjuncture, um, one that, whose shape is only beginning to crystallise. One thing that's been very clear the past few, few years is the importance of resisting racism and organising against racism, of building mass movements against racism, of uniting as broad layers of the left and the population against the uh, emerging far-right and racists and, and so, so on and so forth. But also we see the way now the politics of um, trying, to, uh, trying to prevent catastrophic climate change is beginning to reshape the whole environment in ways that, as I've said, we can't, we don't yet fully understand because the spectrum of political forces that are involved in this process are somewhat different from the traditional left. And that means, to be absolutely honest, that, well, I'll speak for myself, old dogs like me need to learn some new tricks, but more generally, the... Uh, the, the, the serious socialist left, if it wants to relate to this new movement, is going to have to learn how to, to change itself. This is the, the terrain on which I think revolutionaries can have really enormous opportunities to begin not simply to rerun the race with the reformists that I described about on those two, taking place on those two previous occasions because the context is changing and the reformists are in, they're not disappearing, don't get me wrong, but their ability to shape events is, is declining. This is an opportunity for, for revolutionaries if they work in the right way to help to shape these new movements. And this is, this is at a point when we know because of the effects of, that because of the processes of climate change that are already at work, we know we can't afford to fail. So I'll end with uh, something that the German Marxist Walter Benjamin wrote back in the 1930s uh, at a very dark moment in history when the fascists uh, and the Stalinists looked like they were going to completely dominate the, the future of humankind. Of course, they didn't, but it was a very dark moment. He said that um, you shouldn't think of revolution as a kind of train that is rushing ahead, you know, optimistically in, into, into the future. You should think of revolution as the moment when the, um, the train is veering off the rails and you have to pull the emergency cord. That's, that's the challenge that faces us today. <laughs>